how do earthquakes create electromagnetic fields? So the whole thing is that when when you have uh, when you're talking about propagation, it's the ionosphere that creates the RF radio waves, bends the RF radio waves up and down, so that we can receive them, like from Europe or or from Asia or wherever they come in from. And if this rate, if the ionosphere isn't there, the uh, radio waves won't won't propagate, and you won't hear the uh, state the X stations. So uh, this is where this is how earthquakes uh, interfere with the uh, with the uh, <coughs> radio propagation. So uh, this is uh, the, this is what they do is that the earthquakes actually create the piezoelectric effect of the rock sliding, vibrating from top of each other, and uh, microfractures of rocks releasing vast amounts of free electrons. And these, these electrons move up onto the surface and start to rotate. And as, as the electric current rotates, they start to create an electric field. The electric field comes out of the ground. It moves up into the uh, ionosphere and disrupts communication there. And that's how the IR seismograph can detect the, <coughs> in a, in a, detect the uh, changes. And uh, so since the ionosphere contains uh, charged particles, if you have a magnetic field, the charged particles attracted by, an electric, uh, by the magnetic field, and they start to bend. And when they bend, they disrupt the radio communication. And uh, this is one effect that we measured with the RF seismograph. And uh, if you're interested in finding out more about how earthquakes actually change uh, the ionosphere and how they create uh, uh, magnetic waves, uh, there's a uh, uh, earthquake in the sky from a Scientific American. I think that was the October edition from last year. And there's a uh, reference at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. And this article was actually the article that got me thinking uh, that, <coughs> that uh, some of the things that we see in our seismograph have uh, the uh, originate from uh, earthquakes. Uh, slide. Turn it off. Okay, and now you say a hole in the, in the ionosphere. How can how is that possible? Well, here is a, a good example of what's happening at the sun. And uh, at the sun, we have uh, magnetic field lines coming out of the ground and bending around. This bends around the uh, the sunspot, and this is exactly the same kind of idea of what's happening on the on, on Earth but of course on a lot lower level. So this, you can't see the uh, uh, magnetic fields because they're not lit up like the way they are on the sun. But this is what happens. So uh, when you have the earthquake zone here, and then you have a, a magnetic dome, and that magnetic dome pushes out the ionosphere. And as you can see here, as you have radio waves that are bouncing off the ionosphere, over there. So once the uh, magnetic field uh, creates, changes that uh, very drastically, uh, the, the uh, radio waves don't bounce and the communication between the stations stops. And uh, this is the, uh, the, actually the measurement that got us first going on the, on the earthquake theories. And uh, this is uh, October 31st, November 1st, that was when we had, when we had the, the first M5 event that was happening southwest of Port Hardy, that's about 500, uh, 256 kilometers off Port Hardy in the Pacific. And uh, what we can see here on the, on the, on the big graph, <coughs> on the, this is the time of the quake. Like this is the time of the quake here. Like right, this line is, Shown the quake, and you can see you can see that the uh, the red line, which uh, measures the background noise of 80 meters, and uh, it uh, how it how it goes up, and you can actually see that the uh, that the disruption of the 80 meter band starts way before the quake actually releases. So 
you can you can imagine that while the while the uh, before the earthquake strikes, there's a huge energy buildup that's happening in the ground. So you know, like the energy, the energy of gets released, and you can measure that with a shortwave radio. <coughs> Oh, so what's, the, up, what's on the left scale there? I can't read it from here. Oh, it's in, it's a uh, noise level in dB. Noise level. Okay. Okay. Uh, I should maybe take a step back and just explain how how how, uh, how this measurement came about. So what happened is we had uh, a solar eclipse on two, in 2017, and in 2016, uh, two, no, actually 2015, I, I read this article that. Uh, a solar eclipse is going to happen, so we're trying to think about you know, like how could we use our MDSR software on uh, radio equipment to make uh, to measure the uh, solar eclipse, the uh, the changes of propagation. So uh, we spent uh, we put our heads together, and uh, within a year we came up with a software package called RF seismograph. The RF seismograph is a scanning. Uh, uh, Noise background noise monitor. So what uh, what the, the scanning does? It it scans every every 52 seconds six bands. So it stands it scans the 80 meter band, which is represented by red. It 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 scans the uh, 40 meter band, and uh, and so forth, and all the way up to 10 meters. So you can see the different color coded uh, the uh, in each time interval is, is about a, a minute, they're a minute apart, and uh, we developed this uh, by uh, using a, a standard uh, a shortwave radio. We used the uh, uh, option filter port out and uh, put, a fil uh, put a mixer afterwards and turn it into an audio frequency and put the plug that plugs into the, the sound card and, uh, and that measures the uh, the noise level of the of the receiver, and as as the program runs, it scans through, and uh, it uh, takes measurements. So this graph, this is one day graph. It runs 24/7, and it has been running 24/7 uh, since August 2016. So we have six four years of data, and uh, this is the data where we based our research on for the uh, earthquake uh, theory. Okay, so that explains that. Okay, and uh, so, <clears throat> and uh, while we go back to this slide, and uh, you know, once the quake release, oh, what? Once the quake releases here, you know, the energy keeps on bringing up noise, and it drops down. That's about, I would say, about two hours afterwards. And this was only an M5 event. So uh, we, re we uh, mainly concentrated our research on M6 events. There, is, uh, there were uh, uh, 171 uh, M6 events during the time where we have measurements for. And uh, we, got about, uh, we got noise level changes for about 70% of the earthquakes that we looked at. And uh, we all we all did the monitoring from one station, from our Vancouver test station in North Vancouver, Lynn Valley, and all the measurements are taken from there. Are you <coughs> observing this to figure this out, or are you using machine learning or anything like that to... Uh, this is the raw code. Uh, we, 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 have, we make it, if somebody wants to do, uh, uh, a, wants to do something like that, like wants to an analyze our data, we can we can make that available. Our data is available on our Yahoo, on our uh, I/O user group, and uh, if you email me, I can send you a zip file with the data. That would be a great uh, opportunity for students or something to learn. If anybody would wanna do that, I would highly appreciate that because we want we want uh, a second input, and uh, because apparently when you check the internet, there's no. Not, nothing on the internet that says that radio that you can receive earthquakes via the shortwave radio, or even close to that. So this is totally new. <clears throat> Alex, yeah, uh, uh, you, you mentioned M5 and M6 events. Well, yes. How what would that be on the Richter scale? Any idea? Or? 
Uh, uh, what are they? I, don't, I, don't, I think they're, what are the Richter scale? I think the, the Richter, it's the same scale, it's just not, I think the Richter scale is open versus the M scale is, is uh, I think they have uh, nine is the maximum. Mm -hmm. All right. So this was, this was the first time we noticed that, there were, that we actually, like I noticed that life, that something is happening, and uh, that brought us back to the whole idea. Uh, what, we, what we did, again, is uh, our software that we developed creates a CSV file. So there's a CSV file for each day that it gets data on. So every day it creates uh, 1,600 lines of, uh, of data that look like this, like it gives you the time, and then, <clears throat> and then it gives you, it gives you the, uh, it gives you the noise level for each frequency or band, and it just goes on, and every, every day it records a, it records a file, so uh, overall, the uh, time that we recorded, we have about a thousand files already, and uh, this is, and then uh, what we do, what we do is if you have if you have uh, an, an earthquake occur, we know the time where it happens, and uh, we can go back. So we create we create the files per day. It creates the files here, and then we recreate the, the data via Excel spreadsheet. It's a bit cumbersome, but uh, it works. And uh, I like the graphing feature of the Excel graph, and it makes it very nice to uh, show. And uh, just to show you a little bit that we have, uh, there's different different ways of, of looking at uh, seeing where the propagation is. So when you see propagation, when you see the green go like this, go go wide, that's propagation. And at the same time, you can see the red graph, which is 80 meters. And that shows propagation too, and uh, you can see down here, the, the uh, that's 20 meters. 20 meters opens up after 80 meters, uh, on after 80 meters and 40 meters start to close as the as the day goes on. So this is like in the morning, and then 20 meter comes up, and then of course uh, that was recorded uh, quite a while ago, and uh, the solar flux was higher, so there was actually activity on 15 meters, which is this band, and you can see that this is that this is man-made man -made, uh, uh, propagation because of man-made signals because they are so flat. Like when you see lines like this, that's where you where you uh, know that this is created. It's a slow change. It's created by the, by the ionosphere. Or by the surrounding space, and <clears throat> changes nothing changes fast. So the only that's how we can differentiate between a signal of that's created by man and a signal that's created by nature. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go and uh, want to talk about how sensitive the are seismograph is, and we also want we, I'll show you the setup later, but. Uh, what we found is very important for, for this to work is, is that you have to have a resonant antenna for each band that you're working on. So, uh, or that each band that you monitor. Because if the antenna is not resonant, your noise level won't show properly. Like it was just, it just, it just, it just doesn't work. I don't know why. But it definitely makes a huge diff it makes a huge difference. And we tried other people tried it. And they were just using a, a G5 RV, which is not really resonant anywhere. Uh, it didn't work. It didn't get the same graph as, as we do. So there's something to be said about resonant antennas. And uh, the antenna that we use is the is, is the uh, um, uh, one eight uh, uh, high HT Junior. And uh, it's not junior, it's actually 36, 36 feet tall, and uh, it's on top of my, my, my uh, uh, condo, uh, yeah, townhouse, and uh, I'll show you pictures later. 
and uh, it seems to do a very good job. On 80 meters, this specific antenna does a, 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 a topo scatter, so it, so it shoots it up and then it comes down. And this, uh, this probably also has an uh, important implication of, of how the measurement works because all the other antenna, all the other antenna parameters are aimed to go low level in the, like on the horizon, like a low rising, a low angle of attack so they can, can get as much DX as possible. So when you look at these graphs, even though here you, you see, you know, like there's a, an opening on 40 meters, uh, you know, like you have to consider that the antenna is actually looking on the horizon on 40 meters versus on 80 meters. On, on, or, or it looks on the horizon on, 80, on 40 meters and up. And uh, on 80 meters, it looks at the dome of light. So there's a bit, there's a bit of a difference. So when you measure the, when you measure, when you look at the measurement, that has to be taken into effect. But uh, it uh, seems to still pick up the earthquakes, and that's the most important part. <clears throat> so the sense of the, uh, so to come to this slide is, uh, we wanna, we want, what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out how sensitive the R seismograph is, and in order to do that, we needed something small, like a, uh, like a atomic explosion that. Uh, just happened in North Korea twice while we had our measurements done. So this is what we got here. So that uh, they had two underground tests. There was a bomb that exploded, exploded on September 9, 2016 at the Bonchery site and, estimate, and it was estimated only to be 15 to 25 kilotons. So this is a rather small device and the device is underground. So you would not expect to see that on an RF seismograph. But since RF seismograph can see earthquakes, they can also see atomic bombs. And the second blast that, uh, that the, uh, oh, sorry. There. The second blast that they, that they had was uh, on, on September 3rd, in 2017, and that was a, uh, a six, 160 kiloton, <coughs> 70 to 280 kiloton device exploded underground. And uh, here, this is the graph, the plot that we recreated from that day. And this is the time of the explosion. You can see there's about a lag of about 10 minutes. <coughs> And then things started to change. You have to think this is all the way around the world. Like there's a time, there's almost like this is almost on the other side of the world. And all of a sudden, we can see propagation change. The same thing here. This is the 200. This is the seven, the, the larger explosion on the, that happened. What about September 3rd of 2017? Uh, this line indicates the time where they, where they actually indicated the bomb exploded. But again, you know, like you can see the uh, shortwave, ra the shortwave radio noise goes nuts. And you can, you can actually see the same kind of pattern that you can see here. And what surprises me is that this device was this device was exploded underground. So just imagine what would happen if this would be uh, exploded during the day. Uh, and how devastating that would be for all kinds of electronics. <clears throat> all right, next one. OK. So here we have, uh, we're talking about uh, the long-term effect of solar flux on the uh, earthquake measurement. So uh, the measurement uh, definitely, the earthquakes uh, are definitely affected by the solar flux. So if there's, pre, uh, if there's a, a solar storm that blankets out the radio bands, of course, uh, we won't see it because the uh, power that earthquakes put out is limited. So uh, if the bands are not open, we can't see it. 
but the, the interesting part about it is that uh, uh, radio waves, especially 80 meter, you know, like you don't need a lot of power to broadcast around the world. So if you have a transmitter that has a, 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 a that has a, a, a hundred kilowatts, you can definitely uh, uh, pro almost probably guaranteed that you can hear it almost around the world. And uh, the short the uh, short wave radio stations, or AM stations, definitely prove that you can see. Uh, these kinds of things all around the world. So this opens up a whole new interesting way of looking at background noise and seeing, you know, like, like what are all these, what are all these, uh, these little hills, you know, like what does this, how does this relate to what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, event uh, did create uh, that background noise and so this becomes uh, an even more uh, interesting Endeavor when the bands when you have high solar flux and you have you have activity on okay activity on 80 meters and uh, you want and then how that affects your your overall operation of your station but uh, again when the solar flux like is at 100 you know it's very rarely to see 15 meter open because it's just not good enough. And that's when we started our measurements. It was at 100. So uh, I'm looking forward to the next solar high. And uh, we're hoping that uh, we will still be able to run the ARF seismograph to collect data back by then. And uh, we also hope that, uh, that other, other clubs or other uh, people will take up the task and start monitoring background noise and because it's very interesting. So. Uh, here we go about a little bit about the uh, the different types of measurement that we can do and uh, how the R seismograph works. So uh, the R seismograph uh, performs a uh, passive and semi-passive measurement at the same time when it measures. And the way the way it does it because it measures the uh, it measures the background noise and it measure, also measures the noise level. So you have a uh, uh, background noise down here, the noise level up here. So whenever you have a signal that that create that goes on top of the uh, the noise level, you have this extended uh, 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 called this uh, <coughs> widening of the trace. And the trace widens up, like you can see it right here. The noise level changes at the bottom, and then uh, you can see the signal on top. And uh, sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between a man-made signal and uh, a, 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 a nature-created signal. But uh, <clears throat> a semi-passive measurement allows us to do both at the same time. So <clears throat> if there's uh, no signal, it's like the, lines, the line is really, really thin, like it's a really thin line. And it's just a flat, thin line. And uh, see, you can see the noise level changing, but there's no signal. And uh, back here, it's even worse. Like this, the noise level is even changing. But this is uh, this line is uh, 10 meters, so the noise level doesn't usually change. And uh, the really interesting part of the uh, noise level changes comes in at 80 meters. Of could probably go, uh, you know, 160. But then the problem is. A 160 meter antenna is huge, so in order to get the same kind of performance, uh, uh, you know your your antenna becomes unmanageable, or you need some some really big outfit that has a lot of funding, and uh, we've been funded by nobody, so <laughs> so our our budget is rather small. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. Uh, the uh, four-year propagation was earthquake study, and uh, that whole thing started with uh, with us. That first event that was in uh, November first that happened up Prince. Uh, it happened up in Prince uh, Vancouver, north of Vancouver Island, and on about 250 kilometers off, and that got us thinking. So uh, I. I put all the data together and I sent that off to uh, Earthquakes Canada. 
And I didn't think what they were going to come back to me, or they would answer back. So, uh, so I was surprised, you know, and I forgot all about the that that we had that 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 event happened because I uh, you know a lot of things happening, so you forget. And then one of these days, I got the e open up my email. There's an email from X Grade Canada, and says, "Yeah, we looked at your data. Very interesting. Uh, they said, uh, could you do a uh, a correlation of of all your data that you have uh, with all the M6 events that happened during the collection of that time. So uh, that's uh, that's how we get really got started. So in uh, I think it was January this year, uh, uh, I was working overtime trying to get uh, all the events of that earth of these earthquakes uh, uh, replotted from the data that we had collected. And then uh, match them up to the earthquakes that we that they that they were recorded in actual times, and then see if there were any differences. And uh, that's where we came up. So uh, this is how it started. So we had uh, 961 days of recorded data. There were 171 quakes. So uh, M6 quakes, M6 plus quakes, is that not very rare? They happen actually quite regularly. We have an and in, during the study time, there's a there's an M M6 quake plus every 5.7 days. So, but most of the time they occur in in areas where there's nobody, and then they won't create a tsunami. So they just go unnoticed. <clears throat> but uh, there's a lot of M6 quakes. So, uh, and. Uh, so this will come up with 17.3% of our background data that we recreated and looked at. And we're going to have a study, and I'll show you that later. And, uh, and uh, so that's interesting. So that's, that's 17, so you can say 20% of the background noise that you listen to on your show of radio is affected by, by M6 quake. That's huge. And then we go down M5 quakes, that's even more. So, you know, like if you think about it, when you go down to M3 or even lower, you could probably say the earth never stops shaking. So the background noise that you hear on the on the 80 meter band or 160, you know, or even lower, is probably a lot of it is carried by earthquakes. All the earthquakes that we look at, only 15 of them did not have any RF signatures. Uh, that is probably due to a lack of propagation, because if the propagation is bad, you know, we won't be able to see it. And it's just, uh, right now, it's just uh, the worst time. So uh, we were really on the cusp of, 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 uh, of when we started in 2016, like that was already two years past the solar high. and. And uh, that uh, uh, we were lucky that we got it started there, so we were still be able to propagate some of that noise. And uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, okay. So uh, just one more time. Uh, in 26 cases of the of the the earthquakes that we looked at, uh, we could not match the time with the UGS record, and that. I don't know why that's the case, why that was the case, but I think the USGS data is probably the most accurate earthquake data that you can get. That's just uh, so in 122 quakes, 72 percent we were able to see noise increase on 80 meters before and after, or before and after the quake. The before and afters are the most common types. So it seems like most quakes have a, a have the tendency to to send out a RF signature on 80 meters or properly even below. I don't know exactly what's below because we didn't measure that. But uh, it seems like they're quite uh, active a long time before they release and before they actually cause any damage. And uh, you know, with, with that in mind, you know, like you could maybe get three, maybe two hours of, 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 of early warning if you, if you would have a system of this monitoring over the over the world and correlate the signal and then you could you could probably triangulate a signal and 
and you could probably figure out, you know, like where is the next quirk going to go. But uh, we're not quite there yet, but uh, we're working on it. Okay, so this was this was a uh, what the first doc uh, the first the uh, first document that we wrote, and uh, the way this came about is we saw this uh, M5 event on Vancouver Island. And uh, at the same time, there was also this article on the, in the Scientific American uh, stating that uh, that RF earthquakes uh, have uh, um, uh, create, uh, that earthquakes create uh, field lines. So you know, like so, we connected this together, and then uh, we uh, came up that uh, that uh, <clears throat> there's actually a lot of information in our in our data that contains uh, stuff about earthquakes, and they have four years of, of that data collected. So, uh, and, and then again, you know, we created the nine band uh, our seismograph, scanning our seismograph, uh, uh, six band, sorry, six band our seismograph. And uh, here, is what, here is what we saw. Okay, so this is uh, <clears throat> a quick introduction of what we saw. So again, we, we already talked about this. So uh, we don't want to go over this, otherwise it's going to go too long. But here, this, this, uh, uh, this study actually is available on the internet. There's the, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to, you guys can post it on your, on your group site. And uh, there's the uh, uh, link there, so you can go in later and study all the quicks, and there's also the information about it. And uh, this is just a little bit of a glossy of terms to make you understand of, of, of what, what, what we're seeing. So uh, main wave signals again, uh, flat and uh, steady. And then uh, here we go, main wave signal, main wave signal, main wave signal, and this one, main wave signal. And <coughs> then the, while we looking at main wave signals here, this is actually a meteorite. So uh, the R seismograph can also see meteorites. <laughs> and uh, whenever there's something like that happening, uh, we're going to send out the message on the IO user group, on our IO group. So if you're uh, interested in uh, getting RF updates and uh, information on, on what's happening on the, on the propagation, uh, please uh, join our IO group. It's MDSR IO group, and it's also at the end of this presentation. <clears throat> and if we go down a bit further, so, uh, so, <clears throat> and here, this is the earthquake. And uh, so what we, there's a, 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 what happens is, first what happens is, <clears throat> you can see the 80 meter band go up in noise level. So this is noise 80 meter, usually seen before the quake and after the quake. And then uh, uh, that we managed, we edit this manually, like we have a little dot, a little spike here that we put in, so that will indicate the time when the event happened. And then, and then uh, you can see, you know, like about two hours before the event, the RF noise goes up quite steeply. And you can receive, and you can see it, and you can actually see that it's it's a it's a it's not a signal that's been made in space, or it's coming a long way because it has a very short attack time. So you know that the signal is actually something happening on the planet, and it's not far away. <clears throat> okay, so here. Yeah. So uh, we also do uh, we also on site on sitestarter.com. So uh, this is a project, uh, the R seismograph, and uh, we're trying to uh, uh, establish a, uh, a worldwide web where everybody can use our software. Our software will run on Linux also, and as on PC, and also on Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> and, uh, and so and this is this is this is the first couple of slides. So this is this is the first couple of records that we have. So this is uh, propagation our seismograph and we created 
So uh, this was the most quick, uh, the southern East Pacific rise was an M6 quake, and it happened on August 18, 2016. Uh, this is where the quake released. This is where the noise started. You can see quite clearly, this is where the propagation drops out. So what happens, the field lines come out of the ground, disrupt the ionosphere, propagation drops. And uh, this is quite a consistent uh, uh, thing we are seeing. And those would be the two things that you would expect to see if, there, if the earthquake create field lines. And uh, this is a plot that we, was recorded August 20th, 2016. Again, South Georgia, that is in South Georgia Island region. It's an M6.1. And there's when the quake, there's when the quake happened. You can see the rise of the back, the noise level on 80 meters. And then it drops off slowly after the quake. And then after, after the 80 meter cover, uh, after, uh, after the quake, just before the quake in here too, you can see like there's a, a total drop of a propagation here on, on, on 30 meters and uh, even 20 meters drops out and it takes a long time to recover. And uh, sometimes you can see, you can see uh, uh, noise pumps like this. This is on 10 meters and uh, they're also associated with quake. There's so much happening in quakes, it's really hard to pinpoint uh, all the uh, events that happen. So if, prob if we, if we want to understand how this works, we probably need a bigger effort than uh, just one station. Here is we go, uh, so here again, this is, uh, and probably most of us will remember the news events about this one. This is 10 kilometers southeast of Nordica, Italy. You know, we saw, remember the pictures of the broken houses. And uh, sure enough, you know, like if we could, if we, had, if we would have known about this, and we had a network of our seismographs, uh, we could probably warn them that this is coming, because this is about three hours before the earthquake hits, the RF 80 meter RF noise changes. And all at the same time, you know, like the propagation changes here on, 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 on 20 meters. And uh, they have to think about this. This is like this is like almost on the other side of the world. There's a nine-hour time difference between the west coast and here, and our seismograph can pick that up. And uh, this is not the only one. Here we have this is the North Ossetian Islands. That was a 7.1 event, and uh, that was recorded August 28, 2016. And again, there is the earthquake released. And uh, this is what the RF, RF seismograph recorded here on 80 meters and at the same time on 20 meters. And uh, we've seen sometimes that the 20 meter noise comes up as well, but uh, it it's really varies. But what we are, the most consistent one is the 80 meters, that we always can see the 80 meters a few hours before the earthquake strikes. And uh, <clears throat> we have more uh, here. And it goes on and on, and uh, I guess I'm not gonna take too long on this because I don't. Wanna, I could. Pro we have. A, a, we have. A, like, if you're really interested in this, like, we at the end of our at the end of our presentation, we have uh, uh, we have recorded. Uh, we have uh, uh, the documentation for uh, the studies for 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2018 also create. Uh, also creates the first three events that happened in 2019, and uh, it's pretty much the same as as as, uh, as all the ones. The only the, the only difference is that uh, since we're in the solar minimum right now, uh, propagation changes uh, like it gets really poor, so earthquakes don't propagate that well anymore. So, but uh, they surely propagate when this one it happened in New Zealand. And you can see, that's where the quick release, the time of the quake. And uh, this is what the, uh, our seismograph recorded on the, uh, on the 80 meter band and also on the 20 meter band here for a little bit. But this is actually after. But 
AD seems to be the most consistent. And see, yeah, there's another thing that looks like an earthquake. And uh, it, I don't know if it is an earthquake or not, because this could be, this could be a, an M5 event that happened. But uh, since we don't uh, have, uh, uh, we, don't, we didn't have the time or manpower to actually, uh, to actually recreate M5 events, so uh, we only have M6 events. Yes, please? Could it be that part of that noise or aftershocks and stuff like that going on? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely something, something new that we, that we haven't considered that, what earthquakes do. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's a very controversial uh, uh, theories right now. There's a, uh, there's a guy in Japan that, uh, that was actually, uh, uh, was actually responsible for getting that article into the Scientific American about the field lines of the earthquakes. And that there was also the, uh, the indication, like the indi there was also some studies done on the, uh, uh, on some of these strong earthquakes that they had in Japan about how uh, GPS uh, uh, signals get affected by earthquakes. And uh, you can, you can during, the, uh, during or before the earthquakes, the GPS signals can be out like uh, uh, three, 400 meters because the way the, the uh, runtime changes. So instead of being a straight line because of the earthquake bending the ionosphere and there's also this in graphic uh, waves coming out uh, so they bent uh, the, the media for the for the radio waves. So instead of instead of uh, uh, measuring the shortest distance, instead of shortest distance, the runtime changes just enough so that the your GPS would be out by 300 meters. And I think that there's studies about that, but that's GPS, and that's not RF noise. And that's the beauty about this this study is that you have one receiver. And since uh, HF propagates around the world, you can have one receiver, and you can mo you can monitor all the quakes. You can you can see them all, and that's the beauty of uh, of this setup. And uh, the only thing is you have to realize that earthquakes do that. And now that that we know that earthquakes do that, see this is the one that happened in Colombia, Motata. It's a 6.0 event, and again. There's the release of the quake, and uh, you know this one is uh, is uh, tricky. This one wouldn't be hard to tell that that actually would be. You would be really hard to uh, to pre-predict this one because it just comes up like that, and it looks like it looks like uh, uh, actually like uh, noise from space coming up, changing, and uh, but you can you can kind of see that the noise level goes up. So and. It's like each earthquake is so individual. Like you can't, you can't really. Uh, uh, it's really hard to to understand uh, how different they are because it, every ground is different. So uh, here again, uh, <clears throat> that's where the quake releases, and you got a, you got the spike before the quake, and this would be another one uh, really hard to uh, to predict. But uh, when you see this at the end, you can definitely see that there's some noise that's been generated from here. And you can also see here that a, this is 10 meters and uh, changing quite rapidly. And then you have this really signal jump here on, on 20 meters. So <clears throat> it's, of course, uh, all circumstantial evidence because uh, we don't have a, a, a second station to verify or, or anybody to verify that. So we want to just put this out, and we want to, we want to get other people's ideas and see if they if they can see that something like that. <coughs> and it's 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 <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, really interesting uh, to look at these events. So here again, this is uh, Aizu Island, the Japan region, M7.1, <coughs> and again, you know like. The noise level goes up, and it goes up quite rapidly. But again, you have this one will be a really hard one to predict because the noise level in this case rises after the fact. And uh, over here, you have another rise. But uh, since we did, we only have the M6 event. We don't really know why why the noise level rises here. 
So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. <coughs> this is why we need big antennas. We need to be resonant on the antennas. So this is the antenna on top of my roof. And I'm glad that I have very patient neighbors and uh, that my neighbors are great. And uh, I really appreciate that they let me put this up on my roof. And uh, nobody complains. This thing is uh, the uh, HD 118 HD Junior. That's the antenna. I got it from Hiking. It uh, it has a cage for 80 meters, and it has a, a, it's like a a, a, a G match here. So what you can see here is is it's like a, a cross here, and then there's uh, wires that go down from the bottom, and they go from up to here, and they go up here, and you can see the wires go up, and those are the resonance. So th those are those wires are, are create the resonance for uh, 40 meters. 20 meters, 15 meters, and 10 meters. And uh, the cage itself around here, the one up here, that's, uh, cre that uh, creates the resonance <coughs> for 80 meters. And uh, it, it's a really, it's a beautiful antenna. Like, I, I, it takes a while to figure it out and then put it together and to tune it. It's, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's a really nice antenna, so if you, if you want to, you if you want to buy a vertical, uh, and you want a good antenna, this is it, and it's a, it's only about four hundred dollars for the antenna. The way it started out, we start we uh, we developed the MDSR software, and it was a software that uses the output of the uh, of the fil of the optional filter port to uh, to connect uh, the radio to a sound card, so we get. 45 kilohertz out, and then we have a LIF box, which uh, basically is a down converter to get uh, 12 kilohertz IF out, and that goes into the sound cut. And uh, the uh, cut, the like receiver is controlled via cut interface, and then you have the software running the uh, the computer, uh, running the whole uh, setup. And uh, we have uh, two softwares. We have an MDSR software. Which is a uh, by the uh, is a, uh, a receiver and a transmitter connecting the uh, receiver to the computer via IF, and then we also have the RF seismograph, which is a separate software package, but it's in the it's kind of like integrated into the uh, the PC version of the software. So the, if you install it, it's a you install the if you install it on a PC. You, inst you install the setup from our from our from our uh, website. You install that on the computer, and it will also give you the RF seismograph as an add-on. <clears throat> and it, uh, if you want to install the uh, RF seismograph on Linux, we do that. You go to our Yahoo, uh, you go to our IO user group, and uh, there's a wiki there, and it will tell you how to install it on the uh, on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, uh, for the Raspberry Pi, uh, works on the Raspberry Pi, and so if it works on the Raspberry Pi, it should start work on Linux. So if you have a Linux machine, it can also run the RF seismograph. <coughs> and uh, this is how I implement how we implemented the hardware on the uh, on the uh, 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 Raspberry Pi side. So this is a Raspberry Pi, uh, the quad uh, processor unit. You need the quad processor unit in order to get uh, they get the speed you need in order to run their software. And uh, this is a uh, a FIPI audio Weep version 4.1 audio card, and it just uh, <coughs> connects on top of the uh, sound card uh, on on top of the Pi, and then uh, uh, we have a back regulator here. And uh, what the buck regulator does, it, it creates uh, uh, the five volts output for the uh, for the Raspberry Pi, so that you only need 12 volts in. This is the uh, the LIF 116 box. So I got uh, those are the uh, SMD cards that we that we made, and uh, we have we have also for sale. They, they sell for fifty dollars. So this is how you get. Get started. They get the LIF. You can install the RF seismograph. You put the computer together, and then 
namely the huge antenna, so it's, a, it's quite a project to put this together, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, uh, so uh, here we have uh, the, gr the grounding here on the, uh, on the machine. We ground it here and there, and that also, this is also grounded. It's all put together with a grounding slug here, and uh, they have a good ground, definitely works. It's about, uh, it's about at least 3 dB more ground, uh, noise floor. If you go to the I.O. group, uh, it's required that you uh, become a member, so you just sign up, and I will, I will uh, let you uh, access the group. And uh, in the group, we have uh, a lot of image, a lot of pictures of how you modify your receiver, and how you how it's all set up, and how it, how it works. It describes it. There's documentation there, and there's a lot of photos and images. And we also have uh, <coughs> images about things that we were able to see over the years. On, uh, on the solar, on, on the uh, IR seismograph, so we get images about, uh, about we get images about meteors, we got images about weather, and uh, which was a really interesting part of, of the IR seismograph when we just started it out. Uh, what we what we did is the uh, <clears throat> the North Shore Amateur Radio Club has a uh, a site for field day, on beautiful located on top of the on, on top of Cypress Mountain, it just has one drawback. It has such a big drop down to the ocean that when the when the uh, when the clouds come in, the clouds rise up, and when clouds rise, they create radio waves. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> when when the weather is not good and it's usually rains on field day. The, the perception, the reception of the uh, of the radio site is severely hindered by the by the noise of the of the water level rising, and uh, this was actually interesting because uh, I recorded this in 2016, and uh, and, it was, and I looked at it and I said, oh, my measurement must be wrong. There must be something wrong. This can't be right, you know. Like the band's open, it's all, all there, and uh, <clears throat> we still can't. And the, the rece receiver doesn't work; it just gets noise. And uh, that's all we. Uh, I stretched my head and I couldn't figure that one out. And then uh, <clears throat> I posted it on the Yahoo user group, and then a guy from Vancouver Island came back, and he said, "Oh yeah, I have this problem all the time. As soon as the weather changes and the clouds come in." Radio propagation finish. You, know, the, you got noise S9, S plus, <clears throat> and it just covers all up, and you don't get anywhere. So, you know, you guys are actually lucky that you don't have your field day site on the mountain because you don't have that problem. <clears throat> okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is this is the. Uh, the Linux version for YARF seismograph, and we, we set it up. This time, there's a, a second software release that we uh, that we put together, and this one specifically developed for uh, touch screens. So uh, if you want to run your YARF seismograph uh, <clears throat> portable, or you want to just a neat little little display on top of your radio, you can connect it via the uh, LAF con uh, down converter to the sound card of the repeater, uh, to the uh, uh, display, and then you get you get the display working, and you have an our seismograph, you know, telling you exactly what the conditions are, and it tells you that right on top of your radio. <coughs> so uh, the the way it, the way this is designed, it runs via 12 volts, so you don't need an adapter. Uh, <coughs> the unfortunately. The difficult part is that you have to uh, modify, your re modify your receiver if it doesn't have an option filter port. Uh, if you have a, if you have an FD uh, uh, seven uh, eight one seven or seven four seven or uh, eight nine uh, eight nine seven, which have uh, option filter ports, they're really easy to modify because our board. Uh, fits right into the into the filter slot, and uh, 
And if you want to, if you want to check out what all the uh, receiver that we modified and have a documentation for, you go to our website, and uh, that will tell you exactly which receiver <laughs> get modified. And there's also more info on the IO user group. All right, and uh, this is just uh, the uh, we have 2016. So this is this is the port that we developed. Because we want to be able, we wanted to be able to monitor the changes uh, on solar during the solar eclipse, but uh, <clears throat> and uh, we named our software our seismograph because the uh, graph that it creates looks like a, 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 like something that a seismograph would create, so that it actually would see earthquakes. We didn't know, so this was kind of precognition that we came up with this, with this name. But uh, this will be, so this would put in, <coughs> you put in, uh, um, here, you put in uh, 455 kilohertz in, and then on this side, oh no, this is 455 in, and on this side it's 12 kilohertz out, and uh, connects to your sound card, and uh, if you have a 24 bit sound card, it's definitely worth the, the, uh, the effort. It makes the audio quality a lot better, and it's going to be the, uh, a lot better measurement. The uh, conclusion is is, is that uh, when earthquakes create field lines that penetrate out of the out of the ground, and uh, that has severe impact on the propagation, you get a propagation dropout because the signal gets disrupted, and that's the kind of thing that we see on the RF seismograph. Not all quakes do that. Because uh, in order to see it, you have to have a signal pass that goes over the quake. So <clears throat> that's to be in, in the mind. It seems like when you have the 80 meter noise, it's more reliable for measurement on the on the earthquakes. And uh, it uh, it comes down to here that uh, that according to the article on popular science, uh, not popular science, Scientific American. Uh, earthquakes are a huge generator of RF white noise, and uh, <clears throat> if only a couple of uh, if only a couple of watts, 100 watts, <coughs> create noise on 80 meters, our receiver will pick it up, and that's exactly what we see. Like the noise level going up a couple of dBs, <coughs> and uh, that's all it takes. So, <coughs> and. Uh, the uh, use the field lines and the, well, the field lines uh, go up. It's like extending the earthquake into the ionosphere, and then all of a sudden you have everything rattling, and that will change. That will change the way the propagation works, and it change the way the uh, prop, uh, background noise of the receiver. And uh, as you have seen, <coughs> it uh, it's really happening, and. Uh, and in most cases, you have a one to three hour uh, uh, advanced notice that the quake releases. But uh, <clears throat> again, you know, like we only have one test station. So, you know, like we can't do pinpoint it. If you had, if you had multiple stations, you could probably triangulate the signal and then kind of come up with a sort of a region of where the earthquake would happen. So this is something that we want to do in the future is to be able to triangulate. And as soon as we triangulate the thing, uh, we, could, we could start predicting quakes and then have <clears throat> a more accurate uh, understanding of how, how, how the earthquakes create our signals and how we can use them to uh, extend our understanding and help people to evacuate before these, these things go off. And, uh, one of the advantages of using the HF for uh, for, for uh, this kind of research is because again HF propagates worldwide. So in order to so in in the ideal scenario, if it, if the if the earthquake if the if the propagation is reasonable and earthquakes and uh, short uh, short wave radio can propagate around the world. Uh, every station that you monitor the HF band will be able to see that quirk, and there will probably be runtime differences 
between the quakes but, uh, of the noise. So you could kind of make a, a, a conclusion to where that uh, uh, noise is coming from. <clears throat> and uh, they also, uh, again, want to point out the one thing, and we measured, we saw that quite, uh, qu quite often, is that the field lines generated by the quake disrupt the radio communications. So it's uh, sometimes when the radio pops out, it's not interference, local interference from a neighbor or, or something. It's actually thinking about it's an earth, it could be an earthquake. And uh, <clears throat> one way, if you want to monitor the earthquakes, the best way to do it is, is using the, U the US Geological Society website. They got a real-time earthquake uh, monitoring tool, and it's actually quite handy, and I have that on all the time now, because I want to be able to correlate now all the new events <coughs> at right when they happen. And uh, maybe one time I get, one day I will get lucky to actually can record the noise that it makes. Mm -hmm. So once we have the noise, you know, like maybe somebody else is going to hear it because that basically what we do is basically listen to the background noise, like in the way, the way most radios are set up is we just listen to the noise. And, uh, you know, maybe there's something distinctive about it that you can say, oh, yeah, I heard that before. And then you make the connection. And then, you know, if the next quake happens, you hear it again. And so we can point the noise level or the, the, the noise that earthquakes can uh, uh, create to a certain event. And, uh, <clears throat> and we hope that uh, new science will shed new lights on the, on the way quakes work. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the U.S. Geological Society and Earthquakes Canada are, are quite conservative, and uh, <clears throat> it took them quite a while to get their head around uh, this kind of new research. And uh, there's people that say that's nonsense, but uh, you know, like we have uh, four years of data, and we got a lot of. Uh, coincidences that you can't explain otherwise. You, know, you can say, oh yeah, it's all circumstantial data. Yeah, I, you know, like I can understand that you have circumstantial data, you know, you know, out of, you know, like you say 20 events. But uh, we, we definitely have 122 confirmed uh, receptions of noise and over four, four years and they, uh, they match the observances that that we that we made, that we discovered by that quake of uh, that happened in North, uh, just off the Vancouver Island, and uh, <coughs> so I just hope that uh, we can interest a lot of people to uh, to join us and uh, can actually come up with something. And uh, as for science, you know, like I think. Uh, uh, you could probably build your own uh, your own RF seismograph, including antenna, and and the proper rig for about uh, about six hundred thousand dollars. So I think uh, when you look at some of the other science and all the uh, things that universities run, yeah, this is cheap. This is really cheap, and they should really be interesting, like the, I don't see, I don't see why every university here in North America or in the world would not want to run an R seismograph on their own uh, uh, campus to, to further this kind of research. So the question is, how do you get it there? How do you, how do you overcome the reluctant uh, R seis, uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> geologists that say, oh, this is all nonsense. And uh, they don't understand how radio waves work because they're geologists, <clears throat> they're not ham radio guys. So there is a lot of reductance to, to accept this kind of research. And uh, you can always say, oh yeah, but this is one crazy guy's dream. And it's not gonna 
but it's not going to go away because I think we're really on to something. And I uh, hope we can, we can continue this and maybe get some more input from, from universities and maybe also from uh, people <coughs> like, uh, like emergency preparedness people that can maybe look at that and say, oh, this is, could be another, uh, this could be another additional um, <clears throat> point of reference, you know, like you have the, uh, the regular seismographs that indicate when a quake happens, you have uh, the, uh, the P wave uh, analyzers they put on bridges that analyze uh, uh, the, the wobbling of the bridges before the earthquakes actually hit hits, and they would actually they have these warning uh, uh, indicators. I think they're going to be putting it on lines uh, on Lionsgate Bridge, and they should give about a twenty, uh, what two minutes to give you two minutes of warning. So what they, all they can do is they can put all the they can set all the lights to red, and hopefully all the people stop driving and obey the lights. So when the, when the earthquake hits and actually the bridge collapses, in the worst case, uh, that nobody's on the bridge. But this is two minutes. With the R seismograph, if you had a network, you could, you could, you could get advanced warnings to three, four hours. That would, that would help to evacuate a, a town or an area and prevent a lot of human losses. And uh, also with tsunamis, you know, like we haven't uh, specifically tested the theory that that tsunamis create uh, 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 RF noise, uh, but uh, that's something to be done in the future. <coughs> and I'm pretty sure they do create some sort of RF noise. Yeah, you had a question? No, no. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> On the 80 meter band. Yeah. Uh, how much spectrum are you monitoring? Oh, we, 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 the audio card has 20 kilohertz. So uh, we're, what, we're, what we're monitoring is the JT65 channels because they're the most pop, uh, the most consistent to have. Uh, like there's always somebody there. So if that's propagation, you will see something on there. So we monitor the propagation. And uh, if you wanna, if you wanna. Uh, so it's the propagation itself that you're interested in. Yes. Okay. So having human sources is is good. That's why you're focusing on handbands, right? That, that, that's right. Yeah, we want, because, because what we want to do is we want to be able to, to see the signal from, let's say, from Europe, come bounce off the uh, ionosphere. And uh, as long as the sig as long as nothing, as long as this doesn't get disturbed, like there's other ways to get it disturbed, like there's solar wind, there's solar particles, you know, there's uh, thunderstorms, and uh, and, there's, and now there's earthquakes that disturb that, and so you can measure the, uh, yeah, the, the uh, propagation changes of of the band. And, uh, and there's actually two things that happen in an earthquake. Uh, the, the first one is the the pre noise that we can see on 80 meters, and and there's also the uh, signal dropouts uh, that uh, come from the disruption of the ionosphere. So, if, if you're wanting a signal, couldn't we put up a beacon uh, that, that is a steady signal mm. well, and, they, use that, and, and use that? Mm. Well, they actually have ionosons where they do that. Huh? But uh, the problem is ionosons is when, when you're when it right underneath the, the dome of the, earth, of the earthquake field lights, like you shoot the signal up, it won't bend back properly because you won't. Well, well, you won't see it because it won't. Because what you what you want to see is you want to see the disruption of the ionosphere, and uh, I don't know. There may be a possibility to uh, you know like to see that with ionos with an ionosond, but uh, uh, I haven't uh, I haven't heard anybody uh, making a study and saying, oh, we take ionosond data. That exists. There's already uh, uh, several, several, or a dozen of uh, ionosons that monitor the ionosphere <clears throat> that way. where well, you shoot the signal right up. But I think the trick is to actually, to actually go 
and bounce the signal off on a on a long pass, like on a on a, on a very short angle, because the because the change happens very limited and it's it's, 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 it's it's very subtle. So if you shoot the thing straight up, you might not be able to catch it. But uh, I'm guessing because uh, I haven't done any studies. And uh, if anybody knows somebody that has a ionoson and uh, has a, a long uh, has, a, has, a, has recorded the data during the earthquakes, you know that that will be definitely be something to look at. And uh, the only other thing is, if you have an ionosphere uh, propagating up and down, you would only you would only see the earthquake in the local vicinity. You would not be able to see the earthquakes around the world the way you can see them with a with an omnidirectional antenna. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> what's the what's the theory around the the early warning? Like if. If the Earth hasn't started shaking or there's no movement of rocks yet, how, what's the theory around the early warning side of it? Well, there's a, there's a document uh, on the. Uh, okay, here there's a. This is the Scientific American uh, uh, Earthquakes in the Sky uh, document, and this basically got me going on on this whole research. And uh, if you go to this link. Now, well, uh, that will get you to the article, and it describes in detail uh, how earthquakes uh, create uh, magnetic field lines that shoot out and change the way the ionosphere happens. But, but that's after it's after the quake is rumbling and stuff. Is there, no, no, does it talk before. About before as well? Yeah, okay. before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because because the energy has to build up, and then it, it builds the energy builds up and builds up. Until, until it hits a certain threshold, and then the earthquake just breaks. But interestingly enough, the, uh, most earthquakes, you know, when, when you see the 80 meter rumbling, it's just the rumble is just continuous. It doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to be a, a sort of a spike. It just seems like consistent energy, and then, you know, three hours after the quake, the energy, uh, the 80 meter band recovers. <clears throat> and uh, if you want. Uh, uh, Find out where the earthquakes happen here in Canada. Uh, you go to Earthquakes Canada, and uh, interesting enough, you know, like, uh, uh, the U.S. Geological Society and, and, uh, and Earthquakes Canada they must have sort of an exclusive uh, deal because uh, if there's an earthquake happening uh, uh, anywhere, any, anywhere else in the world, you except Canada, you can see it on the U.S. Geological Society. They don't display the Canadian quakes, <laughs> which is which is silly because uh, you know. So Earthquake Canada probably said, "Oh, we do that." So you have to go to Earthquake Canada to uh, make sure they can get all the earthquakes from Canada, and uh, they just updated their website. And uh, so this is the this is the access to the studies that we came up. Uh, you saw part of that, and. Uh, you can just continue on, and it's just, it shows graphics about uh, what we're seeing and how it changes. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation.